I live on the streets. When they meet me, people wonder why. I've made up all sorts of lies, and occasionally told the truth. Even rarer, somebody believes me. I've finally decided to set it down in writing, to record it for after I pass on, and so that I don't have to repeat the story. Next time somebody asks, they can simply read this. Most people just walk past a homeless person. Some will give spare change that's rarer these days with fewer people carrying cash, but there are enough kind people willing to go into shops for me that I get by. Barely. And even more rarely, somebody will stop to talk to me. Most homeless people I know don't ask, we've all experienced trauma of some kind, and we generally don't like to talk about it. My story is unusual though. I'm very articulate, and I'm fluent in English, French, Mandarin, German and Yoruba, with a decent understanding of Swedish, Korean, and Swahili. I'm also very good at talking my way out of situations and persuading people to find common ground. With all these skills, people who talk to me ask, why aren't I, for example, a well-paid translator or diplomat? The answer is simple. Because those jobs take place indoors. For the last seven years I've lived on the streets of a city in West Africa, I won't name it. I get by on the charity of others and doing gardening jobs, and a bit of brick laying in the early stages of construction, at least. I have to bail on those jobs when houses are nearing completion, as you'll see. But I grew up in Northern England. My parents were, are, fairly wealthy, and I attended a private school. Not one you'll likely have heard of, but my education was excellent. My life was going very well, I had plenty of friends, and I was getting good grades in science, French and Latin. I had won a few minor piano competitions, and enjoyed skiing holidays in Switzerland most years. I'm sorry if it sounds like I'm boasting. That's not my intention, I'm just presenting my life as it was, so that you fully appreciate the contrast, and so that you understand I had no reason to run from it. You see, just after my 13th birthday after school on a Friday in June, I was supposed to meet some friends in a coffee shop in town. I was there first, and feeling very grown up, and wanting to show off when they arrived, I ordered a latte. So there I was, sitting alone with my coffee, scrolling through Twitter when a woman approached me. She was 40, maybe 50 years old with long dark hair, and wore what looked like it would have been a very nice business suit 10 years earlier. Now it was ragged, with holes and dark stains. She sat herself down opposite me, and stared at me. I tried to ignore her at first. After a minute or so, I looked up and, with an annoyed tone asked yeah? What do you want? Her response was just three words. I'm so sorry. And then she reached over and touched my hand, stood up, and walked away. I'd never seen her before, and I haven't seen her again since. Now this, of course, puzzled me. She probably had me confused with somebody else, I told myself. It was a weird encounter, sure, but it was over, and it was at least a good story to tell my friends. Whenever they turned up, I was probably a bit more rattled than I admitted to myself, and I had another sip of my coffee and stood up to go to the toilet. 10 meters walk to the toilet. And that was the last time I was ever in England. I pushed open the toilet door, walked through, and was hit in the face by freezing snow. I don't know where I was back then. In shock I turned around to go back through the door, but there was no door there. Instead I was in a field of white. It took me a moment to realize that it was a snowstorm, and that I was outside. I don't think I panicked. I didn't understand what had happened, or how, but I calmly assessed the situation. I was outside, in the cold and the snow, wearing my summer school uniform, shorts and all, with no idea where the nearest shelter was. I could figure out what had happened later, for now, I needed to survive. Looking around, visibility was not as bad as I'd feared. It was daytime, the snow was falling straight down, rather than the storm I'd assumed at first, and I could make out a neat line of trees in the distance. That probably meant a road, and a road meant civilization. So off I headed, across what seemed to be a farmer's field, and in five minutes I was indeed on a road. There were no signs that I could make out, so I picked a direction at random and started walking. After about half an hour I saw a light in the distance. I'd been shivering for some time, but I felt alert, so didn't think I was at immediate risk of hypothermia. I kept going and soon arrived at a small cottage with lights on in the downstairs windows. A man answered my earnest knocks on the front door. He spoke a few words in a language I didn't know, and I pushed into the house, wanting to get in from the cold before explaining myself. And then I was on a beach. It took a moment to get over the shock of the sweltering heat. I blinked in the bright midday sun, and looked around as my eyes started to adjust. 
I heard the sounds of people splashing in the water and generally having fun. Tu vas bien. Tu vas bien. A dark-skinned man in shorts and t-shirt was running towards me, asking if I was okay. I suppose I looked quite bewildered and out of place and was probably the only person nearby still shivering. Still confused, but relieved that he spoke French, a language I understood fairly well, I looked at him and tried to explain what was happening. But truthfully, I didn't know what was happening, and I just stared at him dumbstruck. He introduced himself as Louis. I managed to stammer out a where am I? To which he replied that I was on a beach near Port au Prince. With me still barely able to articulate myself, Louis offered his help. He asked where my parents were, and when I couldn't answer, he led me to his car, saying that he could drive me to his house and we could figure things out from there. I've since learned that this was a very unwise move. Port au Prince, in Haiti, is one of the most crime-ridden cities on the planet, murders and kidnappings are common, and there is a good chance Louis intended to traffic me. But I didn't realize that at the time, and I certainly wasn't thinking straight. I followed Louis up the beach where he led me to a small car and opened the passenger door for me. I climbed into the car and fell quite hard onto the tarmac of a town in the early evening. Now bear in mind that I was 13 years old at the time. In the span of about two hours I'd been accosted by a strange woman, trekked through snow in my shorts, led up a sweltering beach by a stranger, and to top it off, I now had a severely bruised behind. So I think my response to these events was entirely reasonable, given the circumstances. I cried. I looked around, found an out-of-the-way alleyway, hid myself behind some bins, and cried myself to sleep. Somebody woke me by talking loudly. I opened my eyes to see two police, a white man and white woman, standing over me. I knew German only enough to identify the language, not to understand what they were saying. But as I stood up in the chill of the early morning, I suppose they saw my school uniform, and the woman started speaking English. Apparently somebody had seen me there, a child sleeping rough, and called the police. The policewoman was very kind. She asked a lot of questions. Had I lost my school tour group? Where was I staying? Did I know my parents' phone number? I mumbled half answers to her questions and her colleague motioned behind them to the police car I now saw at the end of the alleyway. It was only now that I realized what was happening. Doors were cursed, for me at least. If I tried to get into the police car, who knows where I would end up. For a split second I considered trying to explain things to them, before settling on, again, the only reasonable course of action. It's hard to run from the police, especially when they know the city and you don't but I was still quite small, and I got lucky. I ran down the alley, turned left into a smaller alley, and saw a chain-link fence a short distance along. A hole had been torn. Through the bottom, probably by somebody doing something just like me, and I dived down and crawled through. My school blazer caught on the fence, and I struggled to escape, the police had almost caught me by the time I managed to wriggle out of it, and I ran off, leaving my blazer behind. Good riddance, I thought. It made me far too identifiable anyway. I ran for maybe half an hour, ripping my tie off. Now just dressed in grey shorts and white shirt, I looked a bit less like an English schoolboy, it was Saturday, and I was just another German kid out looking for his friends. Germans don't go to school on Saturday mornings, right? I wondered. Whatever the case, I didn't find any more trouble that morning. I still had 30 pounds for coffee and shopping, and I followed the crowd until I found a small street market. One stall owner was happy to take my 30 pounds for a pair of jeans, a t-shirt, and a plane jumper, and gave me 10 euros to buy a small lunch. I'm sure I was ripped off, but didn't really feel I had much choice. To answer the police's question, no, I didn't know my parents' numbers, and my phone was out of charge anyway. I needed a plan. I walked around town, which I learned was called Passel, and found an out-of-the-way bridge near the river. I decided to stay here at least this evening. It was still early but I was exhausted and just needed to rest after the insanity of only, I realized, 24 hours. It was getting dark when I was aroused from dozing. I was sat against a wall in a 90 degree corner when somebody found me. After a similar exchange to the one I'd had that morning, he spoke in broken English. Victor was 16 and had been on the streets of Passel for about a month. His mom had left years before and his dad had kicked him out of his home when he found out Victor was gay. I hadn't realized that sort of thing still happened. I suppose I had until that day lived a, pardon the pun, sheltered life. Victor was bigger than me and knew the city. 
He hadn't lived on the streets that long but he was far more streetwise than I was, and he showed me how to survive. Over the next few months I learned where to steal food, where to beg, where the driest shelters were, and even how to pickpocket. Hassel has a small homeless community, but a close one, and I got to know some people very well. It's fair to say. By the time my 14th birthday rolled around, I was much more aware and capable. I learned German and practiced my French with a fellow migrant. I learned how to repair clothes and how to haggle with street vendors. I was still small for my age and found that I could wriggle into and hide in very tight spaces. In short, I proved myself to be useful to the homeless community of Passel. Useful enough that others were very happy to indulge my little eccentricities and would go into shops for me when I needed to buy something. I got blankets and a sleeping bag for Winter and Victor would even charge my phone for me in coffee shops and pubs. It wasn't the life I was used to, but it was a life and I had companionship. This all changed after I'd been in Germany. Just over a year. It was early evening, about an hour before kickoff at the European Championship final. Germany was about to play Spain, and there were plenty of people in the pubs getting drunk. Easy pickings for a thief. Victor and I had been working together for a year, and we carried out our well-rehearsed routine. We hung around a busy street until I saw two men come out of a pub, one of them putting his wallet in his back pocket as he left. Perfect. I signaled to Victor and started walking behind them. After a few moments Victor bumped into him from the side, giving me the opportunity to lift his wallet. But his friend had turned his head to look behind him at just the wrong moment. He shouted and the two of them turned to me. I ran and Victor ran the other way, but the two men ignored him. I had a head start and thought I could outrun them, but one was gaining on me. In a split second I decided that it would be easier to hide in a crowd and ran for the door of the packed pub the two men had just left. I pushed the door open and hurtled through it. I arrived in Nanjing at night. Of course I didn't know this at the time, but it was a fairly busy street and I saw the Chinese characters on street signs. I won't go into a blow-by-blow -blow account of my time there, which lasted about a year and a half, but in many respects it was similar to my time in Germany. In a way I was getting used to this, living on the streets is more or less the same in any country. Nanjing is a much larger city than Passel, and quite prosperous, but every city has its down minus. And outs. I sought out the homeless, and while it took me a while longer than in Germany, I learned the language and culture of the place. If you google it, you might think Nanjing is pretty safe. For the most part that's true, but sleeping on the street is no safer there than anywhere else. I found safety in a street gang, putting the skills I'd learned in petty theft and pickpocketing to use. People come and go on the streets, but I ran with a group of five or six younger people while I was there, even having a bit of a thing with Yin, a girl a couple of years older than me. We would do what we called hit and run, we'd all accost somebody out alone, steal their wallet, and run in different directions. The others met up in an abandoned warehouse some way out from the center of town, and they got used to my weird insistence on staying outside and sleeping elsewhere. Nanjing has a heavier police presence than Passel, but my colleagues knew where they didn't go, and I did quite well, until one night in March. We were stalking a couple of drunk men in their 30s, and were about to make our practiced move when another group arrived to do the same. I saw the situation developing, and signaled my people to move out, our competitors followed us down a side street. They clearly wanted a fight, and two of my friends did as well. I was happy to call it a night and managed to talk them down from a confrontation when Yi Chen, who was always a bit trigger happy, threw a punch at one of the others. Three of them pulled knives from their coats, one stabbed Yi Chen in the gut, and the others went for the rest of us. I ran. I was the fastest in our gang, but one of them was faster than me, and he nearly caught me. Seeing no other option, I legged it towards the main street and made my way to a shop. The staff were just closing up, but I didn't need to get in there, I just needed to pass the threshold. I made it through the door. This time I landed in Sweden, in the middle of the countryside. It was early afternoon and sunny, so I walked until I found a road and followed signs to Gothenburg. That was 15 kilometers and a few drivers offered me a lift along the way, though obviously I declined. I was, in a way, starting to feel quite confident now I'd relocated twice and felt that I knew what to do. Sweden is a nice place even for the homeless, especially if you're young and white. Strangers were generally kind and I did well there. 
However, it can get very cold on the streets in winter and when snow started to fall, I realized I wasn't likely to survive until spring. So in November, for the first time, voluntarily, I walked through a shop door and into another country. It didn't help. From the mild first snow of a Swedish winter, I arrived in a forest in freezing temperatures. I'd gone from mid-afternoon in Sweden to evening, so I guessed I was somewhere in Russia, but I couldn't stay. After looking around for a bit, I couldn't find any sign of civilization, so I decided to test my curse. Did that woman, three years earlier, curse me? She had seemed strange but not unkind. Perhaps she simply realized, before I did, that I'd been cursed by someone, or something else. I didn't know, not back then, but I knew a bit about how it worked. I collected some fallen logs and branches, and over about an hour I built a rectangular frame, a doorway. I stepped through. Nothing happened. I arrived on the other side of the doorway. Okay, so that didn't work. Maybe it needed an actual door. I could hardly build hinges in the forest, even if I knew how. So instead I gathered some vines and leaves, and strung them into a hanging door from the top of the frame, like a beaded curtain. Honestly, I was quite proud of my handiwork. For a first attempt with no tools I was very impressed, and almost reluctant to test it. But it was cold and dark, and starting to rain, so I stepped through it. It worked, and my next stop was Kenya. I found myself in the countryside, on a warm evening, on a farm. I judged that it was a long way to a city, and learned later that I was correct. So I decided to introduce myself to the farmers. They spoke barely any English, and I didn't yet speak any Swahili, but I managed to persuade the family that ran the farm to let me work for them. I'm sure they didn't really understand my motivations, a posh white English boy asking only for food in exchange for his labor, choosing to sleep outside, but they were friendly and happy with the arrangement. Over the next two years I learned how the farm worked, built up my muscles, I'm still small and wiry, but strong, and proved myself to be an able worker. I picked coffee beans, milked cows, fixed fences and acquired a decent tan. I even occasionally made the journey to a nearby market town, sitting in the back of one of the flatbed trucks. I was certainly a curiosity to the locals, but I was treated well. I would happily have stayed on that Kenyan farm for life. But after two years, something happened. The father of the household was off at the market town, and the rest of us were working the fields. I was bringing several baskets of coffee beans to the barn, and I heard shouting. Mada! Mada! Help! Help! The mother of the household, Anissa, had fallen in the kitchen. From outside I could tell that her leg was bad. It was bleeding severely, and I think I could see bones sticking out. It was rare that there was just one person in the farmhouse, but it did happen. The closest help was probably at least 10 minutes away and Anissa was bleeding too fast. I was the only one who could help, but I needed to get in there, somehow. Obviously the door was out of the question, but the kitchen window was wide open. Were windows safe? The answer, it turned out, was no. I hope Anissa got the help she needed, though I doubt it. But the last I saw of her, as I swung a leg into the kitchen, was an expression of abject terror. And then she and the farmhouse disappeared, replaced in an instant with the nighttime streets of Seoul. Again I had to start over, and again I had to learn a new language. English isn't well spoken in Korea, and it took me some time before I could get on. I made few friends and supported myself largely by stealing and pickpocketing. Without the kind of network I'd built up in Germany and China, things were more difficult. I got caught a few times and escaped before anything serious happened, until after about a year, I guessed that the police had had a few reports of street thefts in my area. I noticed an increased police presence, and one day I just got sloppy. A couple were having coffee outside a cafe at lunchtime. The man's wallet was on the table between them, and I was hungry. I pulled my hoodie over my face, ran, and grabbed the wallet. While I was running away I pulled the cash out, throwing the wallet on the ground. Then 10 minutes later, the police found me. I'd found another cafe with outdoor service. It wasn't far enough away, and I guess I hadn't hidden my face as well as I thought. I wasn't in a tourist area, and it was pretty easy to identify the only white men around, especially as I was wearing the same clothes. I saw two policemen walking towards me and started to run, but this time they were faster. They tackled me to the ground and bundled me into their patrol car. It was dark. Too dark to see anything. At first I assumed I was on the other side of the world at night, but as my eyes adjusted, I realized I was underground. I was in a vast cavern. There was minimal light, 
coming from a few burning torches in the distance. The ground was rough but solid, and the air was chilly, but no colder than the average night on the street in most towns. I could make out very little at first, and decided to head toward the torches while I figured out what my new situation was. As I got closer I realized the torches surrounded a pit, and I could make out people under the torches, some of them looked up as I approached, but they didn't say anything. All were inside the pit, which I could now see covered a rough square maybe 30 meters to a side. And then I heard something else. A kind of chittering. To the side I saw creatures. Not human, nor like any animal I've ever seen before. They were about a meter tall and walked on four chitinous legs with two arms in front of them. Their bodies were black and glossy, and their heads had large jaws and mandibles. In science class years ago, we had a few stag beetles in a fish tank and these creatures reminded me of those. The beetles came towards me. There were six of them, and while they were smaller than me, they quickly overpowered me. All the while making horrific clicking and chittering sounds, they took me to the edge of the pit. Two more beetles standing. They pushed a long wooden ramp down into the pit, and the others pushed me down it, and then took the ramp back up. I was stuck, or so it seemed. The walls were too high and smooth to easily climb, and I now noticed several more beetles standing guard at intervals along the wall. Even if I got out, I had no idea where I was or what kind of problem I'd found myself in this time. The humans I was with numbered about 50, quite diverse, but young, there were teenagers and people in their 20s, but no older. At 19 I was pretty much in the middle, age-wise. A woman approached me and started speaking French. Great, at least I could understand her. It's impossible to tell time down in that underground cavern, but I gathered it was about the start of their effective night time. The woman, who introduced herself as a Parisian named Josie, explained that the beetles used them for labor and other things, although she refused to elaborate on what other things meant. They kept them fed, made them work for half the day, but otherwise more or less left them alone. Josie introduced me to the others, showed me to the food, almost exclusively berries and mushrooms, and told me to fill my belly and rest as well as I could, as I would be put to hard work the next day. She was right. The next day I was woken by a human, Carl, shaking me. The beetles had already set up the ramp, and were bringing us up in groups of four. I had no intention of being used as a slave, but decided against taking action until I figured things out a bit more. My group was led down a maze of tunnels for about 20 minutes until we arrived at a broader cave, though much smaller than the main cavern. One of the beetles held a flat piece of slate, on which they had drawn a chalk diagram. They may not be able to speak human languages, but they can hold things with their front limbs and draw. It pointed to each of us in turn, then to a part of the drawing, then to an area of the cave. Jerome, a dark-skinned man from Senegal, explained what I'd already figured out, the beetles wanted us to excavate the cave, according to the plan on the slate. There were some crude pickaxes and other tools already in the cave. I looked at the sharp, heavy tools, and looked at the two small beetles. Jerome mouthed no. At me. I learned later that people have tried that before, and they always ended up dead. The creatures were stronger than they looked. So I got to work pickaxing and chiseling out a room for the insects. After maybe an hour, the beetles left. Sandy, a Canadian girl of 15, told me that while we could speak freely, the tunnels were maze-like. She had run once, but if there was anywhere to go, she hadn't found it. The beetles had left a few torches for us to work by, but they had much better night vision than we did, and while we would get lost in the tunnels, they could seemingly make their way just fine in complete darkness. I think insects lay trails using pheromones as well, so they don't even need to see in the tunnels. And so it continued for a long time. I carved out cave rooms, made what I believe was insect furniture, I still don't know where they got the wood, and even worked a forge. We marked our days by our rest periods, and long ago somebody had started scratching lines into the wall of the pit to mark each day. As had become tradition, I scratched my name above the day I arrived, this was day 11408 since the calendar had started, 31 years earlier. We spend our evenings telling stories, true stories of our lives outside, stories we could remember reading, and stories we made up ourselves during the long working days. I suggested singing once, but was shot down immediately. Apparently the Beatles really didn't like human song. Just like living on the streets, people come and go. Haruki, a Japanese man of 25, was crushed by a falling rock in an excavation, I wasn't in the same group, but I heard the screams echoing through the corridors. In accordance with our tradition, we scratched his name below the line for that day. 
Arrivals are marked above and departures, as we euphemistically call deaths, below the timeline. Jason appeared after a few months, followed shortly by Louise, in much the same way as I had. And then Caroline, a 16-year-old girl from Mexico, lost it when we were being corralled into the pit at the end of the day. Everybody can snap if they're pushed too far, and as she reached the ramp, Caroline screamed and shouted, then ran into the darkness. Some of the insects followed her, and this was when I learned how fast they can move. They caught up with Caroline after only a few seconds and dragged her to the edge of the pit, pinning her down until the rest of us were all in there and they had pulled up the ramp. More beetles had arrived and then, in full view of us all, they ripped her apart. Her flesh tore as mandibles slashed into her body. I watched, incapable of help but unable to look away, as she screamed in agony until her windpipe was severed. And then they started to eat her. It took about 10 minutes in all, and at the end of it there was nothing left. No sign that anything had happened, except for the blood that trickled down the wall of the pit. We saw and heard it all, the rending of flesh, the crunching of bone, the chittering of the insects in what I can only interpret as excitement. When they were finished, the beetles stood on the wall, looked down at us, and walked away like nothing had happened. We were in shock, of course. There were no stories told that evening. In fact, nobody spoke as Carl scratched Caroline below the mark for that day. We went to sleep in silence, though I don't know if any of us actually slept that night. I certainly didn't. The next day continued as normal. We worked in subdued silence. We returned to the pit. We ate our meager meal of berries and fungi. I was the first to speak. My life down there wasn't great, but it was something I could get on with, something in which I could find a certain level of contentment. Not any longer. So for the first time, I asked about the doors. Most of my fellows hadn't properly realized that doors were the trigger. It seemed I was the only one who had traveled anywhere else, the underground realm was the first and only trip any of the others had made. Simon, a fellow Englishman, told us that he had once taken some items to the creatures' homes. They lived in carved caves, presumably mined out by previous generations of human captives, and while he didn't understand their culture, they clearly had decorations. While there he saw a large slate with a chalk face drawn on it. A human face, one that he didn't recognize until Jenny had arrived a few days later. He hadn't mentioned this at the time, but it helped me start to put the pieces together, I think. I don't understand my curse, but I believe the creatures marked me. The other humans in that place hadn't traveled around like I did, their first trip through a door took them to the underground. I think the woman in the coffee shop recognized that I was marked and tried to help. I think when she touched me, she disrupted the curse, randomizing my destination. And I thought back to the time I tried to help Anissa, back in the Kenyan farmhouse, and the look on her face as I portaled away. I wonder what she had seen as I disappeared. This was interesting, but it didn't really help us. Then I talked about my travels. How any door, or even window, acted as a portal. How I had created my own, and it didn't work until I'd put a door into the doorway. And gradually, we formed a plan. Most of the floor of the pit was made of smooth stone, but there was a small area of earth, a couple of meters wide. Our captors rarely came down into the pit, they threw food down from above, we carried waste out in buckets, and they didn't need to come down to bring us up as they would simply withhold food if we refused as Jerome recalled from years earlier. It was a simple plan, but a slow one. Over the next few months we smuggled tiny bits of stone, wood, and whatever else we could hide on our person. First we build a wooden board, just small enough to cover the soil. One person would dig out soil from below the board, while the rest of us kept watch, the beetles have small eyes and although their night vision is excellent, I don't they can see very well at a distance, relying more on smell. So if we were careful, we could work without being noticed. And we were careful. If we were caught at any stage of the plan, it would be game over. We worked for less than an hour each night, covering the hole with the board and hiding the board with soil. Extracted earth went, little by little, into our waste buckets. After some time we hit solid rock, but the hole was now about a meter and a half deep. It was enough. Phase 2 of the plan was riskier. Carving into the solid sections of the wood with sharp rocks made a sound a lot like the beetle's speech, and we knew they had good hearing. We only dared do a tiny bit each night. But eventually we had a frame and a door. All we needed now was a hinge. Slowly we scraped out three holes along one side of the door and tied it to the frame with some braided roots we had gathered from the caves. It was done. 
I doubted it would hold together for long, but it didn't need to. We held a quiet celebration, as much as we could down there, and Louise carved a final message at the end of the timeline, F*** you. Sandy volunteered to be the first to test it. For all 50 of us to make it, we would need to move fast, and this is why we had decided to use a trapdoor. It would be quicker to jump down, one after another, than to wriggle horizontally through a doorway that size. We checked the surroundings and, seeing only a couple of beetles not paying much attention to us, we decided on our order. I was number 14. Sandy carefully uncovered the trapdoor, opened it, jumped down, and disappeared. It worked. Trying to contain our excitement, we followed through in our agreed order. As number 11 jumped in, I heard chittering from above. They had noticed something, but we could do nothing about that. We kept filing in until I jumped down. This is when I arrived in Western Africa where I've lived for the last seven years and where I hope to live for the rest of my natural life. Thirteen others had entered the portal before me, but they were nowhere to be seen. I guess, I hope that they are living safely elsewhere, away from the clutches of those monstrous slavers. I pray every night that those behind me in the line got away before the creatures reached them, but I haven't heard from them. I'm not sure how I could, unless one of you is reading this. I still don't know how that woman in the coffee shop knew about me. Perhaps she herself had been there, in that cave or another one, and escaped, it would make sense, given the state of her clothes. Or maybe she's something else, a psychic perhaps. She could walk through doors, and maybe I can now, too, maybe when I left the underground realm, the curse was broken. But I don't dare risk it. Maybe one day I'll see somebody else who is marked and recognize them. I could hardly warn them of the danger, nobody would believe me. But I can touch their skin and disrupt the curse. I've escaped, but the insect things are still there, and who knows how many other colonies they have. It's hard to get exact figures, but in the USA alone, 6,000 people a year go missing and are never found. How many of them are trapped underground, enslaved by a species that regards humans as nothing more than a source of labor and food? Eight years ago I arrived in West Africa. Not out of choice, you understand, but out of necessity. If you haven't read my earlier notes, you won't understand. This is where I landed after I escaped the underground beetle camp and where I've lived for so long. Last year I posted my story online. I just meant to put down my thoughts to ensure my experiences didn't die with me, but I was blown away by the overwhelmingly positive messages in response. The kindness of strangers really is incredible. I suppose I'd resigned myself to my life as it was, a man out of my own country, cut off from family, forced to live on the streets forever. But people gave me hope. It took a bit of work but I tracked down my family. My father died about five years ago. But my mother and sister came to visit me. They stayed a couple of weeks. It was difficult at times, my mother is convinced I had a mental break, and that my story is a delusion, and we both hated when she had to return to England and leave me there. My sister, on the other hand, was more receptive. Hannah's three years older than me, and was a proper older sister to me. She annoyed the crap out of me when I was at school, but over the years I really missed her. I video call my mom whenever I can, about once a week, but me and Hannah WhatsApp each other every day. They're planning to visit me again this summer. Hannah is a logistics manager these days. I can't say I'm entirely sure what that means, but she's one of the most organized people I've ever met. A couple of months after they went back, she invited me to a group chat. She'd found others who had escaped those caverns with me. Over the following weeks, more joined until the group chat had 19 people, plus Hannah. They truly are amazing people, and our experience fighting the Beatles had brought out the best in them. All of us are homeless now of course, most in a foreign country and that brings great risks, but 19 of us had survived, none of us had turned to drugs, and all have stories worth hearing. Chow, a Chinese man living in Mexico, now ran his own landscape gardening business Anupama, or just Anu, an Indian woman now in France has built a homeless charity and is known for choosing to live on the streets with those she helps, Jerome, the Senegalese man, is a celebrated artist on the streets of Moscow. Each of us is fluent in two or more languages, and at least passable in English. We all remember the number we assigned ourselves, the order in which we escaped from the cavern. The last of us to escape was Rajinder, an Indian man who I remembered as a boy of 16. He had been number 26, and had watched as several beetles jumped down into our pen and scuttled towards the remaining humans. Our friends. Josie, number 24, escaped just as the beetles reached them. 
Evander should have been the 25th of us to escape, but instead he was impaled by the sharp leg of one of the beetles and fell to the ground. Others near Raj were injured, Raj himself was slashed across the arm by the serrated edge of a beetle forearm. Surrounded by shiny black death now, he threw himself head first into the door, injuring his head as he arrived in the Vietnamese countryside. He doesn't think anybody else escaped after him. 25 of us got out of the caverns. We don't know what happened to the other six, they could be dead, or perhaps Hannah just hasn't found them yet. We all arrived on land, but who knows where the others came out? If they found themselves in Antarctica, say, or Death Valley, they would have had little chance. I don't think we'll ever find out for sure. So here we were, our group of 19. A few of us have studied insects over the years no, Nita told me, it's entomology. Etymology is the study of words, or geology, to try to make sense of our imprisonment. Some have tried to forget their time below ground, but none of us ever really could. And as we talked, our discussions adapted and evolved. Anna set up a Discord server called Beetle Survivors Social Group but that wasn't enough for her. She sent smartphones to those who didn't already have them, I have no idea how she got smartphones capable of accessing Discord to our members in China and Russia. She sent cash as needed and tracked down most of our families, arranging calls and even visits. And one day, Hannah renamed the server Beetle Survivor Support Group. We talked about our experiences. I posted my story on there, and others wrote up their own. Nita wrote about her research into beetles and how the creatures we encountered must have different biology than the insects known to science. Jerome sketched the beetles excellently and worked with the biologists to figure out how their bodies probably worked. Jason, Angelique, and I drew maps of the caverns, as best we could from memory. Some of us wanted to move on from our experiences, but had spent the last eight years unable to, we all still had nightmares from time to time. Some of us felt frustrated, unable to do anything about the underground insects. And some of us were angry. People began posting fantasies about fighting and killing the beetles, how we could do it, how many we could take down, how we would celebrate over their chitinous corpses. Soon enough, somebody, I think it was Chow, renamed the server again. Beetle Survivors Revenge Group. Fantasy turned into conjecture, which became plans. Frustration became hope, and anger evolved into determination. I'm still amazed that all of us decided to go through with it. We talked about the problems and hazards, we planned our equipment lists, we worked through our ideas, picking holes in and improving each other's suggestions. But in the hundreds of hours of planning, I never once heard the words it's too dangerous. We were as one, a crack unit of commandos, ready to wage war. The date we chose was the 3rd of March, for no particular reason other than we were ready. At exactly 2 p.m. Ghana time. That's where I lived, all 19 of us walked through a door. It was dark. It would take some time for my eyes to adjust from the bright West African sun I couldn't see anything at first, but then there were a couple of clicks, and flashlights blazed into life near me. We came together, and took stock of our situation. There were only four of us in the cavern. Beb, a Russian woman, Bishandu, an Ethiopian woman, and Carl, the American who had woken me on my first morning underground. Feb and Carl turned off their flashlights and we looked around, listening carefully. There didn't seem to be any beetles near us, presumably because they hadn't been expecting arrivals. We quietly moved together, looking for the wall of the cave. The caverns were once natural, but they have been worked by human hands over many years, being expanded and smoothed over. This worked to our advantage as we traversed the largely stone-free floor and eventually found the relatively flat cave wall. We worked our way along it, still mostly by touch rather than sight, and soon came across an opening. A corridor. A short way down the corridor we found another opening, coming to a small, empty room. We settled down and went through our equipment. Feb turned her torch on. We needed to see, but this made us very uncomfortable. How I would have loved to be able to close the door to prevent the light leaking out into the corridor. But the beetles don't have doors, and even if they had, we wouldn't have been able to use them. Bisha and Carl had brought several USB battery packs. We each fully charged our phones before stepping through the doors, but we had no idea how long we would be down there. We turned off all our phones except for Carl's, which he set to power saving mode. We all had battery powered flashlights, and Feb had a lot of spare batteries. They should last a while. Carl was in the army when he was kidnapped and had explained to all of us what sort of food we should bring, so we all had a couple of weeks of high-calorie food in our backpacks. We also had weapons. 
Bisha was a markswoman, and had a hunting rifle and a pistol, with a lot of ammunition. Carl had been working in a quarry, and had brought his powerful granite breaking pick. Feb had somehow managed to acquire a couple of fire axes. And I, well, as an occasional gardener, I'd managed to pick up two machetes and four bill hooks. Not everybody has heard of bill hooks. They're used to cut down small trees and undergrowth, and those I had sported a 10 inch serrated blade, viciously curved at the end. I figured they would be excellent for severing the limbs of the beetles, and I had a decent amount of experience with them, although only against saplings that didn't fight back. There were 19 of us who entered a door a few minutes earlier. Feb, Carl, Bisha and I had arrived down here very close together at the same time, but there was no sign of the others. Our group had a variety of personalities and reasons for coming here, some were angry, some wanted revenge, some were driven by a desire to make the world safer, but I knew everybody well and I don't believe anyone bottled it, certainly not 15 of us. Perhaps we might find the others elsewhere in the cave, but for now, we had to assume that we were the only ones who made it. Fortunately all of our equipment came with us, though it was a shame we didn't have just flamethrower. We had hopes to have enough armed humans for a proper assault. Now we had to change our strategy. Carl was the best of us to plan, he had been on active duty and experienced combat in a small group. The most important thing right now, he said, was for us to get the lay of the land. We weren't sure exactly where we were. And our maps were incomplete, so the first thing was to orient ourselves in the cave system and find out where the beetles were. Feb, the smallest of us and light on her feet, offered to scout around and report back, but Carl insisted on going with her. We must never, he said, go out alone. So Bisha and I sat in the small room in whispered conversation, our hands never far from our weapons, while Feb and Carl crept away. I thought back to Bisha's broken English when we lived together in the darkness, and marveled at her near fluency in her newly acquired Australian accent. It must have been more than two hours when we heard movement nearby. I barely heard Bisha stand up, although the quiet click when she cocked her pistol sounded like a gunshot in the silence of the caves. As I reached for a machete, Carl's whisper sounded. Don't cock your pistol, Bisha. It's double action, you don't need to and it's too loud. Carl and Feb came round the corner. The caves were so dark I don't know if I saw their silhouettes, or only imagined them. The pair sat down. It's not the same cave, said Feb. My heart stopped and my mind raced. Had this all been for nothing? Were we in some random empty underground system, trapped here to die? It's smaller, she continued. At least, the main cavern is. We found a pen, like ours but much smaller. There are burning torches around it, but no humans. It might be their work time, but we haven't seen any so far. Maybe they don't have any slaves right now. There are beetles down here, though, Carl said. We heard some of their clicking off in the distance. We're not sure how many there are. This corridor has a few small rooms like this all empty. Probably something they started excavating, but abandoned. Or they had to wait for new slaves. And we're pretty sure we found where they live. We didn't investigate, not with just two of us. I have to say, Carl and Feb made a great team. They'd been reunited in person only hours ago, but were already finishing each other's sentences. Carl brought out a chemical glow stick. He had many of these, and I was grateful, a flashlight would just have dazzled us at that moment. He and Feb sketched out a rough map of what they had explored so far, and we started to plan. We would only get one chance at a surprise attack, so our first strike needed to be precise. Aim too small and we wouldn't do enough to hurt them, too big and they would overwhelm us. We only had two guns between us, so Bisha kept her hunting rifle, she'd become quite a markswoman hunting small game in the Australian outback, and gave the pistol to Carl. Bisha and I and walked out to explore for ourselves. The main cavern was left out of our small cave, so we turned right. The single corridor quickly branched off into multiple paths. Bisha had brought several balls of string, so we tied one end to an outcropping to help lead us back. It was a risk, but then so was coming here in the first place, and we were reasonably sure by now that this region was abandoned, at least temporarily. We both had several of Carl's chemical glow sticks, and used one to light our way, hiding it whenever we heard the slightest sound. We didn't even try to map that maze-like area of small corridors and dead ends. Bisha and I held hands whenever space allowed, and held the other's backpack when it didn't. Her hearing is far more sensitive than mine, so if she suddenly dropped my hand, I knew it was to grip her rifle, and that was my cue to unclip a billhook and machete from my belt. 
We moved extremely slowly, creeping silently along the left wall, pausing to listen every few meters. We can't have gone more than a few hundred meters when, an hour later, I saw something in front of us. I let go of Bish's hand, put the glow stick away, and brought up a machete and a billhook. Bisha saw it as well, and raised her rifle. There were two of us. Two, against these creatures we'd watched massacre our friend years earlier. A rifle and a couple of knives. I hate to admit it, but when it came. To fight, flight or freeze, I froze. I don't know what went on in Bish's head at that moment, but for me, it was abject terror. I would simply have been useless in a fight. There was a light, very faint and flickering, but getting brighter. The two of us stood there frozen, anticipating a confrontation. A moment later we heard footsteps, clear as anything in the otherwise absolute silence. They were human footsteps, and underneath those, the occasional faint clicking of a beetle. As the light got closer, we could see the scene clearly. The tunnel widened until, about 30 meters in front of us, it came to an end as another tunnel crossed it. Three humans, very thin and in ragged clothes, walked past followed by two beetles. We watched as they passed in front of us, and then the torchlight and the sound slowly faded. We stood in absolute silence for what must have been half an hour. Bisha was the first to speak. She put her hand to my head, bringing my ear to her mouth, and in the quietest whisper ever made by a human, made her proposal. It's sleep time. Carl and Feb said the beetles live on the other side of the main cavern. We should explore. I nodded my agreement, then, realizing that she couldn't see me, whispered okay into her ear. Our progress was even slower and more careful now. At the junction we tied the string off, not wanting to leave any trace. On the path they'd taken, and headed in the direction they'd come from. There was a faint light up ahead, but no sound at all, and gradually we were able to make out the shape of the corridor. Eventually, we came to a split in the corridor. The light was coming from the left branch, so that's where we went. And soon we arrived in a large room. I'd worked the forge occasionally back in our first cavern system, so although it was different, I recognized it immediately. The light was coming from the embers of a stone kiln, which would die completely in the next few hours. We looked around the place, deserted at this time. As expected, there were a few tools that could be used as weapons, but nothing as useful as our own, and not that. Many, the beetles weren't keen to supply their slaves with anything more powerful than necessary. A chimney led to a small hole in the ceiling, it surely led outside, but it was no more than 20 centimeters wide, far too narrow for any of us to squeeze through. Nearby there was a thick, flat iron plate, which I assumed to be an anvil, though different from the one I'd used. A hammer lay on top of it. The room was fairly large, but apart from some firewood and lumps of rock, presumably iron ore, it was otherwise empty. We'd seen enough, and headed back out to take the other path. This path led quite quickly to another large cavern, but without any light. After listening for several minutes, I brought out my glow stick, but it had expired. Bisha reached into her pack and retrieved her flashlight. This room was a mine, and much bigger than the forge. Several pickaxes were stowed at the far side of the room. Again, it was empty of living creatures. We both knew how it would work, the beetles usher the slaves in, who then move far enough away before taking their pickaxes and starting work. The mine consisted of a main room and smaller corridors, gradually hacked away until the place had become a bit of a warren. We recalled the maze we had been careful not to get lost in earlier, perhaps that was an earlier mine, abandoned after the iron or the beetles had been so keen to get had been mined out. As a teenage boy I'd been wiry and very capable of squeezing into small places, so I volunteered to explore the tunnels while Bisha stayed outside with the flashlight to guide me back. Some of the excavations were plenty big enough for a couple of miners to work side by side, some, presumably natural tunnels, were barely big enough for me to traverse. A few times the flashlight went out, this was Bisha's signal to me that she heard something, and I froze in absolute silence until the light came back on, when she was sure it wasn't an unwelcome interruption. Eventually I came back out, grabbed a notepad and pencil and sketched a map of the tunnels. Then Bisha turned her flashlight off and we set off back through the darkness. Before we headed back, we wanted to check one last thing out. Where had the humans and beetles who passed us gone? We were fairly sure, but wanted to be certain. We carefully followed the path they'd taken and after some time, came out into the main cavern. Off in the distance we could make out torches around the human pen and a few shadows of beetles moving around. We had no desire to go in unprepared, so we headed back to the junction. The string guided us home, and, exhausted, we were reunited with Feb and Carl. 
We compared our maps. We were fairly sure we had a pretty comprehensive map of most of the complex, with the notable exceptions of the Maze Bisha and I had found, and the presumed living quarters Feb and Carl had located but not entered. We started to make a plan. Feb was the most vicious of us eager to just start hacking limbs off the beetles, but she gave way to Carl's expertise in warfare. I pointed out that we had never actually fought a beetle, and it would be good to strike small at first. Eventually we came up with the first part of a plan, ate a good amount of food to keep ourselves strong, and went to sleep. We spent the next day waiting. Our timing was off, and the slaves would have been at work already by the time we woke up. Feb had actually brought a pack of cards, and by the light of a single flashlight, we each taught each other various games. We slept again, awoke in plenty of time, and the four of us made our way to the mine. It was empty, as we expected, and we each hid ourselves from view in the larger mined out tunnels. An hour, maybe two, in utter silence and darkness. Then we saw the flicker of an orange torchlight. I steeled myself, reminding myself that we had four of us. I'd put on a big show of bravery, but honestly, if there weren't weren't two people with guns, I don't know if I'd have been any use at all. Bisha, Carl and Feb were completely hidden, only I had a view of the entrance. Five humans entered, followed by three beetles. Bisha and I had hoped for just two beetles, like we'd seen leaving the last time, but this was our best chance. I waited for the humans to cross the main cave to their picks, then shouted now. The four of us turned on flashlights on the floor and leapt into action. Feb and I moved to the sides and held back, while Bisha fired her hunting rifle. She was an excellent shot, striking one right in the mouth. That would have taken down a human instantly, but the beetles were tough and it screamed and lunged forward. Or at least, I assume the high-pitched screeching was the beetle equivalent of a scream. Carl unloaded all eight shots of the pistol into the injured beetle's head. The crack of chitin splitting apart rang across the cavern, and the insect collapsed to the ground, just centimeters from me. One down, two left. I had a bill hook in each hand. A beetle was right in my face, I'd forgotten just how fast they can move and plunged its front claw. At my chest. I leapt back just in time and swung my right bill hook at its extended claw. I connected, and using the hook to keep its claw out of the way, stepped sideways to attack its nearest leg with my left bill hook. I hooked and pulled with all my strength. The leg popped out, clattering across the floor. Black stuff oozed out of its abdomen. It swung its other front claw at me, but it was unbalanced now. I parried with my left bill hook and released it from my right, using it to strike its mandibles from above. One was severed instantly. The thing collapsed to the ground, but it was still moving. Still dangerous. I moved to the side, out of the way of its front limbs, and pushed both blades into its head. It stopped moving. I looked around. Carl's granite-breaking pick was lodged deep in the abdomen of the third beetle as he retrieved the empty pistol from the floor and started reloading. Feb on the other hand was hacking away at the motionless insect's head with a fireeks while she shouted a mixture of Russian and Chechen swear words with occasional English interjections. Ha! How you like that, Svolik? Her back was to the cave entrance. Bisha was the first to spot it. Feb, behind you. Feb started to turn. Too late blood showered my face. Carl unloaded his pistol. Both Feb, and the beetle that had attacked her, fell to the ground, revealing another beetle behind. Them. Click. Blam. Bish's rifle hit home and pieces of chitin exploded around us. The beetle, wounded but not down, turned and ran. It could not be allowed to fetch reinforcements. Click. Blam. It stumbled, but continued to limp on. Carl grabbed a bill hook from me and chased it down. The speed from his adrenaline was more than enough to catch the slowed beetle. Knowing that he had it, I turned my attention to Feb. Feb was covered in blood, conscious but looking terribly pale. A front beetle limb pierced her side, having gone all the way through. I hacked it off at the beast's thorax, but I knew I could not pull it out, the serrated edge would have ripped her apart. If I drew it back, and if I pulled forward, it would just widen the wound. Carl returned, and retrieved his medical kit. As he started to treat Feb's injuries, I braced myself for his remonstrations against her for turning her back, for shouting, for losing her attention and focus when she needed it most. I did not expect what came out of his mouth. You did well girl. That's when I knew, I think. Feb tried to sit up. No, don't move. I've got this. If HH. Feb sputtered, and blood dribbled from her mouth. Is it gonna be okay? 
I kill it. You were amazing, Feb. You killed it. Now relax. I'll sort you out in no time. That. You. Those were Feb's last words. She slumped to the ground. Carl laid her down and closed her eyes. I've been homeless for the last 16 years. This is why. Bisha, her voice quavering, was the first to speak. Now what? I turned to Carl, expecting him to say something, but was surprised to hear the words come out of my own mouth, seeing with a fury I never knew I was capable of. Now, I said slowly and deliberately, now we kill every last one of them. It was a voice I didn't recognize. In the intensity of the combat, we'd all completely forgotten about the five miners towards the back of the cave. Three women and two men, none of them out of their teens, stared on in shock. They were too surprised to join in the fight, but they all desperately wanted out of there, and though they were weak, we knew as we traded our knowledge and experience that they would fight to the very last. There was no chance we could persuade them to let us take the fight to the beetles alone. We stood and sat in the burning orange of the torches and the brilliant white of the flashlights always watching the cave entrance as we talked. There were eight slaves down here, a much smaller group than ours had been. None of them had been down here for more than a few months, and it was then that Bisha realized that these beetles were smaller. Not by much, but it was noticeable. This beetle colony must be younger than ours. The miners figured there were only about 30 beetles. Closer to 25, now that we'd killed these ones. Rosa, a 16-year-old German girl, was somehow able to distinguish between them, although they all looked the same to me, she had even given them names like Dark Claw, Shiny Top, and Bent Tooth. With paper for the first time in the four months she'd been in the darkness, she wrote them all down and crossed five names off. There were 24 remaining. Of course, we couldn't know how many there might be which she hadn't seen. I asked where the other three slaves would be. Martin, a Slovakian boy, said they hadn't seen where they went, but it would probably be the forge, guarded by the two beetles who had come in last. So Bisha and I headed to the forge and found the three, still working, and brought them back. The last two beetles we had fought had come from the forge when they heard us fighting, and we didn't encounter any more on the way. Eleven humans, led by the three of us who were more experienced and not weakened by the conditions of slavery. Our eight new recruits chose their preferred weapons from among the picks and hammer sent. My spare billhooks had a little to eat and drink not too much, said Carl, your body's not used to it, and then we walked silently along the long, wide tunnel to the main cavern. If we were quick, the others may not yet have realized anything was amiss. In the dim light of the slave pit's distant torches, we could see four or five beetles wandering about, doing whatever it is that beetle slavers do when there aren't any slaves around to torment. We huddled around to whisper our tactics, always wary of the beetles' excellent hearing. And as we discussed our options, their advantages and pitfalls, Bors, a boy from Jordan, said simply, what about the gallery? Bisha, Carl, and I looked at him in astonishment, though we couldn't read each other's expressions. What gallery? Whispered Carl. Bors pointed up. The gallery, above the entrance to their home. You could pick them off from there with the guns. I looked, and could just make it out. About 10 meters up, something like a balcony ran along a quarter of the cavern wall on the opposite side to us. If such a thing existed in our old home, none of us had noticed it. A few minutes later, we had a new plan. We would sneak around the edge of the cavern, enter the insect's home, and try to stealthily make our way up to the gallery, as Bors called it. Carl, having traveled to the entrance two days earlier, led the way. In absolute silence, trying not to breathe or even emit any smells, and occasionally freezing if a beetle looked like it might get too close, it took us maybe half an hour to travel a hundred meters. We only noticed the beetles when they chittered or moved in front of a torch, and we weren't doing any of that. The entrance, a tall, wide, rectangular hole in the cavern wall, was as much in darkness as anywhere else. Somehow we got there without being spotted. Carl felt his way along the wall and led us into a room on the left. We filed in silently, and Carl brought out one of his weaker glow sticks. We were in as far as we could tell, a tool storage room. A cube hollowed out from the rock, barely big enough for us all to fit. In there, wooden tables, seemingly of human craftsmanship, lined the walls, and on these tables were all manner of strange tools. I could hardly guess at the function of most of them, and some of them I didn't even know how a beetle could manipulate them. I didn't care. The room had just one entrance, as long as no beetle needed a tool, we would be safe here while a small group scouted the rest of the complex. This time it was Carl and I who moved silently through the caves by the dim light of a glow stick, while Bisha stayed with the others. 
There were a couple more rooms storing various equipment, in one, we found obviously human artifacts, such as watches, credit cards, and mobile phones. We made a note to lead the survivors through here when we were sure it was safe. A long corridor led past these rooms and to a crossroad. We took the left path first. In the living area, there were occasional patches of some sort of gently glowing moss, barely enough to see by, but it meant that we could usually get away with putting the glow stick away. We soon came to an opening on our right and carefully stepped through. I froze, and I can't speak for Carl, but my heart dropped into my stomach. The faint light of the moss in the room shone green reflections off the glossy armor of maybe a dozen beetles. Carl and I stood motionless for what seemed like an eternity, until I felt a gentle tap and then a tug on my shoulder. Very carefully, very slowly, I edged back out of the room and we made our way back to the crossroad. In furtive whispers, we discussed what we'd seen. The beetles were laying on the ground, on what looked like a bed of dried leaves and undergrowth. I recalled a suggestion by Nita, that beetles as large as these would use a tremendous amount of energy while active, and that they may sleep a lot more than humans. Carl proposed that if there were indeed about 30 beetles, it seemed that only half or a third were awake at a time. We decided to leave them alone for now, and continue exploring. We crept back down the corridor, past the sleeping area, and came to a small room just before the corridor bent around to the left and started to rise. We guessed it would take us to the gallery and decided to check out the room before making our way up. This room had a bit more moss. I could make out Carl's face and the smooth round walls of the cave, which was only about 6 meters across. In the middle was a raised platform, about waist high to a human. For some reason the thought of a baptismal font came into my mind. We edged slowly towards it. The platform held a rocky bowl, about 40 centimeters wide, filled with water. The water seemed to reflect more light than it had any right to. And as I peered into it, I did not see my reflection. I saw somebody else's face. She was about 20 years old, with pale freckled skin and curly hair. I didn't recognize her. I asked Carl what he saw, and it was the same. Then he pointed to another platform, a small table. On it were a few pieces of chalk and about a dozen slates, the topmost slate held a drawing of the same girl we saw in the bowl. This was it. My heart pounded. This was how they got us. I couldn't fathom how it would work, but they used this bowl, or one like it, to seek us out, mark us, and bring us here. The slates must be part of it, perhaps they saw many people in the bowl and drew the ones they decided to kidnap. I whispered excitedly, we could destroy the bowl and stop at least this beetle nest from bringing anybody here. Carl disavowed me of that idea. It would be a simple matter for the beetles to just rebuild. Like I'd said just a few hours. Earlier, we needed to get rid of them all of them. For now, then, we would continue our exploration. We could always come back. We left the round chamber and continued on, along and up the tunnel. We were right. The slope led us up into the main cavern. We made sure the gallery was empty, then lay down and peered over the edge. Watching from safety, we realized there were only three beetles on patrol down there. 29, minus the five we had killed and the three on patrol, left 21 unaccounted for, at least half of which we'd found sleeping. A tug from Carl. We were on the rightmost edge of the gallery, so every so slowly, and keeping as low as we could, we hugged the wall and edged along it. As we suspected, there was another corridor leading down from the far end of the gallery. We had crossed over the entrance to the living quarters and we're on the other side. We've been gone quite a while now, and Bisha and the others might be getting worried. We agreed to explore this area and head back. Several twists and turns later, the corridor widened and straightened, and I estimated we were back on the same level as our companions. Dimly illuminated in front of us by the occasional patch of glowing moss, we could see three openings on either side of the corridor. This time I was the one to touch Carl's shoulder. I'd heard movement. We watched in silence, Carl pointing the pistol, me with bill hooks in each hand. Three doorways down, a shadow. Quiet chittering. The faint outline of a shiny black carapace. Moving, where? We stood as quiet and motionless as statues. The outline got smaller. A few moments later, the shape rounded a corner and was gone. Ten minutes later, Carl and I dared to breathe again. Carl stayed put while I gingerly pushed forward and moved my head into the nearest doorway. No beetles. I did the same for all six entrances, keeping well enough to the side to give Carl a good shot, if he needed it. All were now empty. I returned to Carl and we entered one of the rooms. 
I'd taken the beetles for bronze age creatures, but what I saw blew that notion out of the water. Now granted, my understanding of tech trees is limited to playing Civilization IV when I was 12, but these guys were well into the Renaissance age and maybe a lot further. Glass jars and tubes indicated they knew chemistry. Samples of strange powders lay in shallow curved pots. There was a setup of lenses, which I took to be a form of microscope. We moved on to another room. Here were gears, some sort of half-finished clockwork contraption. I'd seen the beetles grip things, but had no idea they could be so dexterous. I made a mental note to examine a front claw if I got the chance. Another room had something I remembered from back in school. Different colored metals, placed in a rectangular box full of liquid, and metal wires coming out of them. The beetles were making electricity. The other rooms had contraptions neither Carl nor I could even guess at. They were clearly scientists, some of them at least. I would have found it difficult to operate their machines with my human hands. Their inventions were obviously designed for beetles, but their purpose eluded us. We didn't stay long, ever wary of the slightest noise. Besides, we'd been gone maybe two hours at that point. At the end of the corridor, another passage went left and right. We very carefully peeked around the corner, no beetles, and not too far. Away on the left, we could just make out the crossroads from earlier. Slowly, silently, we crept back, made a left turn, and returned to the group. I'd been a little worried that they might have got impatient, or assumed us captured or killed. But there they were, some asleep against the walls, some playing cards in the dim light of a blue glow stick. Bisha got up and gave me a long hug. Are you okay? Did you find a way out? Carl and I woke everybody and drew a map. The storage rooms where we rested, the strange bowl of water, the bizarre science laboratories, the gallery, with entrances at either end, and the room where many of the beetles lay sleeping. We get them. Now, before they wake up. It's near the end of the workday. It was a boy about 18 years old, whose name I hadn't caught yet. We need a plan, Carl said. We can't go rushing in minus. But it was too late. The boy had already stood up and was on the move as quickly as a person can move without making a sound. Bisha turned to Carl and I we have to. So all 11 of us grabbed our equipment and stealthied away. Carl put a hand on the boy's shoulder and persuaded him to listen to his plan. If the plan hadn't involved killing the beetles immediately, I doubt the boy would have slowed down. When we got there, it was clear that the beetles had moved. None appeared awake but I knew that they had shifted around in that room at some point in the last couple of hours. At Carl's direction, we moved silently into the room, shifting around to position ourselves in pairs near a beetle. But we weren't all in position yet. A chittering came from outside. The beetles started to move all at once, and were upright in less than a second. I'm not sure what happened next, everything moved so fast. I swung my bill hooks. Muzzle flashes lit. Up the room and rang in my ears curses in half a dozen languages. I tripped on the leg of a beetle. It pinned me to the ground. Mandibles snapped centimeters from my face. Helplessness. I was dead. Bang. Bang. The beetles had exploded. I pushed it off me, got to my feet. Another was next to me. Pincer slashed my arm. Bill hook swinging right and left, its legs ripped off. Bang bang bang. A third to my side, a slash to its thorax, and a pickaxe from the dark into its head. The next, where was the next? I saw nothing. Bang. Blinded by muzzle flashes, I could make out nothing else. Three strong light sticks hit the floor, and two flashlights searched the ground. Chitinous limbs lay scattered about. Black fluid oozed like eicher from dozens of wounds. And there, a human arm, a foot, a leg with bone sticking out. Did any get away? Carl made no pretense at stealth now. I don't know. I didn't see. They're not moving. Did we get them all? Slowly we started to calm down as we saw no motion from the oversized bugs. But to be sure, we went methodically from one to the next, severing the heads of those who still had them. We counted 15 beetles down. We'd had the element of surprise. But it wasn't enough. Four of the rescued slaves, slower and weaker than Bisha, Carl and I, were among the dead, and two others lay dying beyond hope. We had all sustained injuries, and I counted myself lucky to have received a mere flesh wound. As an ex-soldier, I don't envy what Carl had to do next. After we made the two mortally wounded girls as comfortable as they could be, Carl whispered to them. He never told us what he said, but I saw each in turn nod their heads. Carl then brought up his pistol, and with a single shot to the head each, 
put them out of their misery. He kneeled down in silence for several minutes. When he stood up, Bishop put her hand on him. Are you minus? Don't. There were five of us left. Bisha, Carl and myself, plus the German girl Rosa and a Polynesian boy named Salima. We knew. We hadn't got all the Beatles, and stealth was off the table now. It was me who spoke first. There are two directions in the living area we haven't tried. Left at the crossroads and straight past the workshops. If there's a way out, it must be one of those. Left was closer, so we went that way. I wish we hadn't. The corridor bent ever so slightly, just enough to block our vision until we got there. When we rounded the last corner, we saw what has haunted me every night since. I call it the throne room. She was bigger than I would have imagined possible, at least 8 meters tall. Her body was swollen and her abdomen dripped with mucus. Around the room lay dozens of eggs as big as my hand, some intact others broken open. As her enormous compound eyes turned on us, her mouth opened wide, revealing hundreds of sharp teeth like no beetle I've ever seen. The shriek that came from that mouth cannot be described in words, except to say that it froze my blood. But then, a human voice. It's got no mandibles. It was true. No mandibles, and no limbs. It was helpless. Bisha and Carl opened fire with everything they had. The queen thrashed her body violently, and spewed dark liquid in our direction, but it didn't last long. Bisha showed off her markswomanship, and Carl demonstrated how quickly he could reload the pistol. The queen gave a final screech and collapsed to the ground, shaking the throne room like an earthquake. Helpless, I thought. I was wrong. Salima had caught the worst of the sticky black substance the queen had sent our way, and was down on the ground, struggling to move. And then we heard it. Hundreds of chittering, clicking insects came from all around the room minus. And Salima was their first meal. The beetles that swarmed him barely came up to my ankle, but there were too many of them. Salima was dead in seconds, or at least, I hope he was. Run! Said Bisha, and none of us argued. There was only one way to go, one corridor we hadn't tried. We made it to the crossroads and Carl threw an industrial glow stick ahead of us as we turned left. More beetles, adult-sized, were speeding towards us. We ran with every ounce of strength down that corridor. We didn't know if it was our best option, just that it was our only option. As we fled, Carl and Bisha turned to take shots at the enemy. We hurtled past the corridor that led to the workshops and into the unknown. Even with the covering fire, the beetles were gaining on us. But after 50 meters, we saw a light up ahead. I grabbed a flashlight from Carl's belt and pointed. The tunnel ended ahead of us and another tunnel continued, nearly 2 meters above us. A tunnel made of earth and roots. A tunnel through which shone daylight. With an almost inhuman burst of speed, Rosa leapt and scrambled up the wall and into the earthen tunnel. Go, Bisha. I cried, putting my hands down to push her feet up. Bisha climbed up and grabbed a root. The root gave way, and the pressure as she fell back on my hands was almost too much for me to bear. But I wasn't letting go so easily. I pushed with all my might and she scrambled to safety. Bisha turned back and leveled her rifle at me. Blam. Blam. A beetle, now dead, hurtled into my back and knocked me to the ground. Bisha reached her hand down and I. Grabbed it. Carl was shooting fast enough that the beetles were advancing slowly, waiting for an opportunity. With Bisha's help, I scrambled up and looked back. Carl shot again. Click. Bill hooks. Shouted Carl. I threw both of mine down to him, he caught one, while the other clattered to the ground. Run. We ran. Carl was surrounded. There were at least four, maybe more, of those beasts around him. He had no chance, but he didn't try to escape. I hope he took a lot of them down with him. I know that none of them followed us into daylight. We tried to help Rosa, but she wanted nothing to do with us anymore. I can't say I blame her. After we stopped running, miles from the caves, she left us with barely a word. I don't know where she went. We emerged, we found out later, in the forests of Romania. Bisha and I are an item now, and Hannah is arranging for a house to be built for us with no doors or windows. We've talked about kids, but we have no idea if the curse would pass to them. 19 of us entered doors that day. Four of us arrived in the same cavern, but months later, we haven't heard from any of the rest. We thought there was just one system, we know better now. These things could be everywhere. With luck, killing the queen is enough to shut down that particular nest, but there are only three of. 
us with the curse, and Rosa hasn't joined our Discord group. Carl and Feb are dead. Fifteen others are unaccounted for. If anybody takes the fight to the Beatles again, it will have to be a new generation, Bisha and I are retired. We just hope that our story here might be of use to our future comrades in arms.